Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope that wherever in the world and whenever in time you find yourself listening to this, that you are happy and healthy and well mentally. I um, yesterday recorded pretty much (laughs) how I felt about being personally attacked by multiple people all in one day and I woke up so happy and it was just the darndest thing that this happened and um, it occurred to me today that people that abuse regularly abuse other people after they get their say so out they seem to be totally fine they hurt the empath and then they go off and make a phone call and have an oh so happy go lucky conversation they watch TV and laugh out loud at the jokes they listen to music and suddenly get really happy whereas the empathic person is stuck with the remains of the day lying as if they are dead things in their hands you're you're left to pick up the pieces of the hurt feelings and they stick with you for three or four days last night my twin flames he felt I could feel him I could sense him sensing me and my hurt feelings and as I started to sleep last night I felt his arms around me and it really helped to think that at least somebody somewhere in the world you know feels me and feels my pain and gives a damn you know I know you guys do but I mean as far as like I don't have anyone in my immediate vicinity in my life. And I was thinking about to the other day when I just could sound weird, but I went into the butcher shop, the local butcher shop. That's brand new. A guy who funny, funny enough. I thought he was from New York. There's, he's got a New York like energy about him, but he grew up in Northern California and went to school in Berkeley. He's from the Bay area. No wonder I like this guy. He's just, he's got the vibe. I love the Bay Area in California. And um, I walked into into his shop and he hugged me. So good. Such a good hug. He said, I'm so glad you're back. I'm so happy that you're my customer. And he just gave me the best hug. And then when I went to leave to pay, and oh man, I mean, I got some sharp cheese that's so sharp it cuts your tongue <laughs> and sourdough bread you can't even get sourdough bread in South America but in his butcher shop he makes sure that you can and I got some steaks and just some really good stuff and he um, he hugged me goodbye too and it was like two or three days later I started thinking about that how great it felt to be there Somebody who doesn't really know me, but they still hug me and just with an open heart can love so many people. He must be an empath. I mean, he even made it a point to tell me that all the animals that um, have been butchered for his to sell as meat in a shop, when they were alive, they were loved. They had free range of this huge farm. Their pet, they're loved. Um... You know, they know that that was what they were there for. And I know a lot of people still have problems with that. And I still have a hard time reconciling it. But when my body needs it because of health reasons, I'd rather have, you know, an animal that was loved than an animal, you know, that knew what was going on than an animal that was factory farmed and treated poorly. Because I don't want to support that at all. (sighs) It's all an illusion anyway, but it's just a pervasive one. It's irritating sometimes. But anyway, when this guy hugged me and 
I felt so great. And a few days later, I, it, it dawned on me that aside from my, my son giving me a hug like once a week or every other week, that was the only person who's like hugged me in a deep heartfelt hug like since Christmas day this is June so I mean six months or maybe seven no about six six months about and just uh I think that might be how that might have a factor that might be a part of like feeling badly when people attack you and when you have a whole day where the only interactions you have for the whole day like 90% of your interactions are people like personally attacking you and accusing you unfairly and unjustly because they don't understand you or they remain ignorant and refuse to become educated on a topic. I think when you don't have someone in your life regularly supporting you, that's when it can lower your self-esteem and your confidence wanes as well. I only, these are just thoughts that I've been having lately the past two days. I, I mean, I'm still feeling very, very hurt. This person that attacked me yesterday tried to engage once more by sending me three quotes from the Quran talking about things that I never once said that I did or that I do. One of them was about people who employ magic to break up a couple, which I have never, ever, ever done magic to hurt another human being ever. And I never will. It's not who I am. And, um, I don't know. I just, (laughs) I read what he said and I just ignored him for like six or seven hours. And then after that, he saw that I'd read it. So he just put a period (laughs) like that's, you know, these are what I have to say to you. And then like six hours later, period (laughs) and I'm like alright so I wait another couple hours and I send him a video of an imam talking about how you should never judge others not for their religious beliefs not for their acts or deeds or any words that they speak because it's really none of your business (laughs) including the idea that you could judge somebody for something that they said yesterday, but you don't know if they've asked for forgiveness during the night. That's if you know for a fact they did wrong yesterday, but you don't have a right to judge them today because in the middle of the night, they might have already been forgiven by God, and that's all that matters. God is all pervasive, all loving, all forgiving. So... I don't know. I'm, it's just weird. I don't know. Just the whole, my whole experience from yesterday is still with me today. I hope to God it's better tomorrow. I still managed to get a few things done. I bought my plane ticket to Quito where I'm going to attempt to get my visa to stay in this country another 11 months. <laughs> then I have to reapply and do the whole thing again. But, uh, I don't know what I guess what bothers me is that this person heard the word magic from me. And even though there might be 30 words in the paragraph, the only word he saw was magic. And he took it completely out of context to berate me. Belittle me, tell me I'm a bad person and that I'm evil. And that have nothing to do with God. Whereas a knowing person knows that magic is a gift that directly comes from God. And then I was reminded of the life and teachings of the masters of the Far East. 
It was written in 1894 or 1896, something like that, in the 1890s. Victorian era, early Victorian era, where these scientists traveled to the Himalaya mountains in search of the great ones, the masters, the ascended masters, who still live there and in some cases have lived there for thousands of years in a higher dimension and sometimes came down to the third dimension when people needed um, healing or teaching. And I read the first two books and it's like six books in the series and I didn't get quite to it. It's out of print. It's really hard to find. When you find it, just please go out of your way to buy it. Even if it's $200, it's worth every penny for the stories of it. But in this book, these books, I learned that these ascended masters said to the astonished scientists as they were performing miracles, (laughs) <laughs> like they didn't have any water so they grabbed a cup and put the cup on the counter and in a couple seconds there was water and a couple seconds later it was boiling water and and then they said well what do you want tea or coffee we'll make that and then they said well tea would be fine and then now the tea appeared in there and then the guys the scientists said well we're all hungry how are we going to get food we're really scared we don't want to starve and it's snowing outside and we might die if we don't eat and the master said well why do you have such little faith in us you think that we'd bring you all this way like and not take care of your needs when we know we're responsible for you are you why would you think we would do that what do you want bread here and they held out their hands And um, fresh loaves of bread appeared in their hands. And they handed it to the scientists who were astonished as well as relieved because they got to eat. And the ascended master said, what you see before you, you call a miracle or you attribute to trickery or magic. But what we attribute to what we do is that we understand a higher science that you simply do not understand. We have the knowledge, we have the wisdom, and because you don't, you're calling it magic. And that's something that's always stuck with me because I realize now that Magic, especially higher magic. Like I, I, I have magical abilities, but I can't create a loaf of bread in my hand. I know people can. I know someone who creates burritos when he when he was living in the old nowhere. He created. He figured it out. He was by himself for six months. <laughs> he figured it out, and he could create a burrito, a hot, big chicken burrito in his hand. And he said that it it was a little bit less um, satisfying than if he had eaten a real burrito, like that he had made physically, because it was like a lighter from a higher dimension. It's a really weird story, but he just says, well, you just have to know how to do it. It's really easy once you know how to do it. And I've read many, many accounts of masters that used quote unquote magic, which is literally just a holy science. There's a whole book called The Holy Science by Swami Sri Yukteswarji, who was the master and guru of Paramahansa Yogananda, who who founded Self-Realization Fellowship. You know, I guess what it is, is I'm never upset for the reason I think, and perhaps I'm upset because while I was trying to enlighten somebody they wish to remain ignorant and I'm not mad at them I'm mad at myself because I did not heed the words of Jesus who said do not cast your pearls before swine lest they be trampled and again all of it goes back to honestly just being lonely 
I'm lonely, so lonely in the sense that I don't really have people that I could talk to about what I know. This is why I have my podcast. I'm talking to the whole wide world (laughs) and 46 of you have decided to stick with it and be my regular listeners. (laughs) I'm getting up to a hundred different listens a day, but that means some of you are catching up on old programs. (laughs) So I'm grateful to have my hashtag soul tribe and my hashtag soul family along for the ride with me. It makes me very happy that you're here. You know, listening, at least somebody's out there listening. And every now and again, I get wonderful feedback. And I'm so grateful to you guys when you do write me a little note. When you do follow me on Twitter and say, hey, I love your podcast, keep up the good work, or I'm learning so much. Just last night when I finished my show, I got a tweet, or I read a tweet that from a guy who told me he's deaf. And as part of the deaf community, he's so upset that he cannot hear my podcast. And do I have the transcripts yet? Oh man, it made me feel so bad, but I did tell him it kind of gave me a little bit more, um, fodder, (laughs) a little bit more, um, fuel to ignite the fire (laughs) under my ass (laughs) to get my books of my transcripts out there and put them out on Amazon. I also told him that my goal is to get 10,000 copies out for free of each of my books that I put out before I start charging money for them. And then, of course, there'll be a discount and then eventually the full price. But it made me feel like I kind of knew, I kind of felt that, you know, blind people can hear me. But deaf people can't, and I don't want to disinclude anybody, obviously, from the information. I think that spiritual seekers should have the wisdom they seek available um, when they're ready for it. And if I'm the teacher to teach them, cool. I mean, I guess in some ways I'm a teacher. A lot of people have said, I'm learning so much from you. You're a great teacher. And for me, I just feel like I'm me. I got this knowledge and I'm imparting to you what I got from other people. Most of it, a lot of it's from my higher guidance or my own observations and thinking and stuff that comes out of literally just being alone. When I was married for 13 years, I didn't socialize much except for with my husband daily and my kids when they came along most of my interactions outside of my immediate family like that, besides, of course, my mother on the phone, my father, most of my interactions just really were with spirit and the fairy folk and the djinn and angels and all the animals in the forest that came to my yard. Bears a couple times, mountain lions, once or twice, they never approached my property. But, um, <laughs> blue jays, one time a really beautiful green bird I didn't even know existed, looked like a finch of some kind, which is a common bird down here in Ecuador, so it was weird it was up there. And, uh, ravens, lots of ravens, wolves, we had wolves in our yard, Sasquatch, <laughs> a couple times. We had Sasquatch and deer, deer all the time, all the time, deer almost every day. And one time an owl flew past my face and brushed my face with his wing very tenderly as he took off. He was that close to me. I hadn't seen him. He was being very silent and stealthy. And once in a great while, people's dogs would get out and come over and hug me. You know, so I had a lot of love and interaction from the natural world. And I don't feel that as much. I mean, we've got Fred and Ethel Mertz, the pigeons outside on the window, windowsill. (laughs) And Ethel, I feel love from her. Fred, I feel angst from him. He gets really angry when I don't feed him. He's a very aggressive pigeon, which is why their little baby, Freddie Jr., 
was an aggressive little bastard. <laughs> and they had to kick him out. As soon as he could fly, they're like, get the hell out of here, man. Seriously. He was like disrupting everybody's peace. Like in the morning, he, he started knocking on the window with his beak and like making these horrible noises at us and attacking us and walking all over his parents. He was a little bastard, man. <laughs> so the parents kicked him out, but the dad is pretty aggressive and I don't know. I just, it's like, I don't have the interaction with the animal kingdom. Like I did. And I don't know why, maybe because I've raised up in vibration so much. I don't know why the stray dogs don't seem to give a crap about humans one way or the other. You know, if we could give them food, then they'll like come near us. Otherwise they don't care. They're happy being wild. It's very weird. I mean, every other place in the world I've been with stray dogs, usually they're craving that attention from humans and that love. And I've had stray dogs ask me for favors of healing and it's just not happening here. Maybe I'm going through the final phases of being uh, rejected, which was my stupid life theme I picked was this rejection thing. I mean, it's like in the past couple years, it's been really and truly few and far between that I even get a hug or a, a social interaction with someone. You know, and then when I do meet people that want to socialize, which it's been like almost a year, maybe eight or nine months since that has happened. But when that was happening, it was always like the most boring conversations. And I'm not trying to be mean because these people are perfectly sweet and lovely. It's just that I want these deep conversations and it's like nobody, nobody wants a conversation that's deep that I've run into. Not in the past couple of years. And it, all of it has me questioning and thinking, you know, I know my higher guidance says, no, stick with Ecuador, stay there. You, you know, stay there, become a citizen. But I'm so like, I don't know why I'm kind of confused. Where else would I even go on the world? Is it me? Is it you? Is it me? <laughs> I don't know. These are thoughts of a lonely, I don't know what you want to call me, but <laughs> light worker, hey, yoga, shaman. You know, feeling a little bit like the sad clown today, you know what I mean? Sacred clown, yes, but sad sacred clown. You know, it could be because, though, the Ascension Symptoms scale is still at 99. Lots of plasma waves coming our way. Um, as far as this Schumann resonance, though, it was lower. It's lower. I'm going to read that, too, though, in a second. Um, yeah, the Schumann resonance today, it, it only reached 14 hertz, so it's been extremely low today. But I still managed to sleep about, I don't know, 14 hours again. Three days in a row, sleeping excessive. And one of the people I listened to said that he discovered that when you reach that delta phase sleep, that's when you are going to integrate most with your crystalline body. So you have to start getting a lot of sleep. Make sure you get into those deeper, deeper states of sleep. So Schumann residents today, they only wrote in the evening at 1700. And they write, today's activity has manifested itself in the form of constant micro peaks from 22 UTC yesterday until 11 a.m. UTC today. The maximum amplitude has reached a low level, 14 hertz. So not even double what is normal, but, you know, but it was constant. So the, it, like we're still getting some, some kind of a little bit of a push, but wasn't huge today. But this ascension symptom scale was pretty big. I woke up with a, uh, after a perplexing series of dreams about the same exact thing. But I remember, I mean, there's like a mystery I had to solve about where someone disappeared to or ran a restaurant. It was like my mind's creating a crazy mystery just because I was bored. <laughs> but before that, I had this disturbing dream that woke me up and it was disturbing at my, I was disturbed at my own behavior and it was a venting dream from how I used to act when I was a teenager 
And it's kind of embarrassing. I tell you guys this anyway, because you should pay attention to dreams like this. Cause so you know what it is. I was walking down the hall at a hostel in my dream. Like it was like me now, but I was behaving like I was then and it wasn't a hostel I've ever been to. I just made up a place in my mind and I was walking down the hallway and I saw this really good looking guy and I was like, Ooh, I want to attract him. Ooh, Ooh. Like it's not even how I act at all ever now. <laughs> but when I was a teenager, I did. And I thought, Oh, what's my best feature quick. And I turned around so he could see my butt. <laughs> and he just kind of smiled and kept walking. And I woke up really disturbed by that. Like, what the hell was I doing? Why did I make that decision to objectify myself in my sleep? And I realized that this is how I and all the people I knew when I was a kid used to act. Like, we're just a bunch of bloody baboons showing our asses to people to try to find a mate. You know, it's very primal, primate behavior, literally animal behavior and <laughs> it's how we all thought of ourselves when you know back in the 80s we were all objectifying ourselves back in the 80s so I wonder if you guys don't have some of this stuff lingering around your psyche that you should probably just let go of stop objectifying yourself and then I woke up and I'm like, well, why didn't I show my boobs? Wait a minute. That's further objectification. No, wait a minute. And I realized what, what are my best features? Why do I think that's it? And then, then I started really thinking about I'm like, well, I know my heart. I have a big heart and I love very deeply. And I'm very empathic and I'm very loving to others. That's one of my best features. Plus my brain, I'm intelligent and I can remember um, spiritual basic principles. I don't remember names, dates, and places like I used to, but I do remember spiritual principles and I do remember spiritual insights that I've received over the years. And, and I'm always able to work out why things are the way they are. And I'm an INTJ. So I'm able to put things together in a way that most people can't or don't. And I know my brain is one of my best features. <laughs> You know, it's, I guess I get really angry when people ask me, um, for a picture. Oh, I want a picture of you. Why? Well, you're beautiful. So what? <laughs> I get really mad about it. And I never got mad about it before. My oldest said, well, mom, that's objectification. Why do you put up with that crap? Like, well, people want to see me. She's like, no, they just want to objectify your face, your lips, your eyes, whatever the hell, your hair. It's like, ew, ew. You know, it's the millennials that even though a lot of times on movies and TV shows, there's a backlash against millennials written by people my age, no doubt. They're irritated that they cannot continue to write in a sexist way or an objectification way. And even I'm guilty of sexism in my writing, even objectification. You know, even though usually what I'll do is I'll have someone who's objectifying men or women and they get their comeuppance, <laughs> they learn their lesson, but it takes a while. I, I do write stories like that, but kind of the moral of the tale is not to do that sort of type of story. But even though the millennials regain this massive backlash on TV and movies and in the media, they don't really deserve it. They're not being quote unquote, overly sensitive. They're being wide awake. Their eyes are open. And I think we ought to start listening to, to the 20 year olds of the world. My oldest son is so brilliant and he's so, he's so, um, wide awake. And I'm so grateful about that. And every time I talk to him, you know, mom, that word's not okay. Mom, that idea is not okay. Mom, why do you let yourself be sold short? Why do you allow men to look at you? 
in a way that they should not. You know, it's like I'm always getting these like little mini lectures, but there's always, um, it's always coming from a place of love and I always feel that love and I always see the deep, clear wisdom in it. So I wonder if you guys have ever had these conversations. (laughs) Is it just me? Am I like a man stuck in the 1950s in a woman's body in the 2010s. <laughs> I, you know, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, anyone who's like maybe, I would say the age of like 34 and up tend to have these weird views of sexuality and gender roles and just the cisgendered heteronormative ideas that are um, super old fashioned and when you really consider them they're super weird and there's so much objectification so it's no wonder I woke up this morning (laughs) deeply disturbed from a dream I had in which I objectified myself and it's only because I bought into the story of all the people around me like Are you really just as good as your waistline? Hell no. Are you really just as good as how big your your bra cup size is? No. You know, you have big boobs, does that mean you're stupid? No. (laughs) You have small boobs, does that mean you're dumb? No. Does it mean you're more sensible if you have blonde or brunette hair versus blonde hair? No. All these weird stereotypes that are based on objectification, it's, it's just got to go. It's 3D stuff that we have all have to let go of. So beware of the full moon coming up with all the anger issues and also, also all of these issues as well. Weird ways in which we allow ourselves to be objectified so we quote-unquote fit in or quote-unquote attract the opposite gender. Even my friend who's like 34, every time he came over to my house, he would take his shirt off. And he had a really fit body, gorgeous body. But his mind was stuck in the 1940s, and it was just so weird. And, like, he go, look at my arms. I'm so strong. I'm a good man for you, like, type of thing. And I'm like, ew. Ew. (laughs) I'm sorry. When it comes to men, I'm attracted to uh, someone with a strong mind, super, super intelligent. And I'm attracted to somebody with integrity and humility you know like I don't know it's not always about the hot young guys although it's wonderful if a brilliant mind comes along with a guy who's fit and young but it's not the first thing I look for I look for aura first the energy field of somebody I look for a spiritual connection I look for intelligence And I look for humility and integrity. If they say something and they do that something, they have integrity. If they say they're going to be there for you and you don't see them for three weeks, that's a lack of integrity. I don't like that. I don't go for that. So I don't know. I mean, just uh, all these thoughts have been kind of coming through the last three or four days. And I wanted to bring it up in case there's some residual weirdness that you have inside of you that you have not yet let go of or reconciled don't allow yourself to be objectified and don't put yourself whether you're a man or a woman doesn't matter don't objectify yourself in a way that you're just trying to get the attention of somebody who probably wouldn't look at you anyway or wouldn't consider you anyway like acting like you're something you're not or presenting yourself like "Ooh, look at my nice legs so what It's more important to see your nice brain. Well, we don't want to see your brain. (laughs) But I mean, your intelligence, let your smile show. The most important thing you can wear is your smile. And the most important thing that people should notice about you is your intelligence and your sincerity. And when you're genuine, when you're able to bring forth your truth of who you truly are and you're raw and powerful in those moments 
those are my thoughts for today. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to read A Course in Miracles Lesson 7 before I forget. It's very short, but it's very deep. I see only the past. I see only the past. So I'm not going to read the whole lesson. Please go to ACIM.org and look up lesson seven. But if nothing you see means anything and everything you see only means something like with the meaning you give it, right? Everything I see, nothing means anything except for the meaning I give it, right? And now the idea is I see only the past. So when you look around the room and you say, I see only the past in this purse. I see only the past in this pillow. I see only the past in this notebook. I see only the past in that table. I see only the past in that pen. I see only the past in that face. I see only the past in that body. See only the past in that coffee cup. It's true because anything you see in anything you associate with the thing that you see is the association is based on past experience feeling that blanket against your face feeling that coffee cup against your lips knowing the coffee cup can break because you broke a coffee cup in the past you know when you look at stuff around your room you're associating it with past memories so anything that you can physically see is pretty much you're just looking at the past all right guys i have a really cool uh treat for you when i come right back i hope you enjoy this one it's a surprise <laughs> let the please let the commercial play out it is how i get my funding i only get 1.7 cents for every time you listen to the commercial but now's your chance. Run to the bathroom real quick. Come right back because you're not going to want to miss the second half of this show. If you're listening to this, you obviously like podcasts and you probably like music too. Long walks on the beach, romantic dancing under the stars, and oh wait, we're not doing that right now. <laughs> on Spotify, you can listen to all of that in one place for free and you don't even need a premium account, which is cool. Free is always good. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcasts so you never miss an episode. Download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, including your long romantic walks on the beach. Also, one, one thing I love about Spotify is that you can easily share what you're listening to with your friends via Spotify's integrations with the social platforms like Instagram. So that makes it really, really versatile. Just search for Metaphysical Soul Speak on the Spotify app or browse podcasts in the Your Library tab. And follow me, of course, don't forget, so that you'll never again miss an episode of Metaphysical Soul Speak. Spotify is the world's leading music streaming service, and now it can be your go-to for podcasts, too. Thank you guys so much for supporting Metaphysical Soul Speak on Spotify. Khalil Gibran was a Lebanese-American born writer and poet. And one of his most famous works, The Prophet, that was first published in 1923 by Albert A. Knopf Company, 
basically January 1st, 2019 became a part of the public domain. So woohoo, I get to read it to you guys and I'm going to read it to you. I've decided that between now and every Saturday until I finish, I'm going to read some selections, well, from the beginning through the end of Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. This book has meant a lot to me over the years. My personal story with it is that I my friend had given it to me and I started to read it and loved it. Read the whole thing and just absolutely loved it. Then I met my husband, my second husband, who I had my children with. We read it together. And when we got our uh when we wrote our own Uh, not only just our vows, but our entire wedding. We wrote the entire thing. I wrote it. He wrote his own vows. But we based everything on what we read in the prophet. And we did read quite a bit of the prophet. (laughs) Was read during our wedding. And then when I was pregnant with my first child, I read the book, to her while she was in the womb. Same thing with my second son. And when I sent out the birth announcements for my children, they each got their own verse from the prophet on the birth announcement that was sent out to all of our family and friends. And when I sent this out to my mom, she called me and was crying because she read this book out loud to me while I was in the womb. And after I was born, she gave me away to strangers. So I was adopted and I never knew that about my mom. And I I got in touch with her when I was 30 for the first time I met her when I was like 30 or 31, no 30, I was 30. So I didn't know for 30 years my mom had read this to me in the womb and I didn't bother to tell her what I was reading my child in the womb. So I don't know. It's This book is very, very special. My first week in Detroit with my children after we bought our house there, we were invited by the Detroit Institute of the Arts because I signed up immediately for their newsletter. We were invited to go see the premiere of the cartoon version the animated version of the prophet the story about the prophet it had a lot of the teachings of Khalil Gibran in the movie and Selma Hayek was the director and producer and basically it was her project it was her pet project because this also meant a great deal to her We literally saw the first worldwide premiere showing that was absolutely free on the lawn of the Detroit Institute of the Arts. We sat with hundreds of people in the grass on a pretty overcast kind of rainy day, (laughs) but we all stayed outside anyway, even though all of our butts got wet sitting in that wet, wet grass. The, The movie was so, so amazing that Nobody got up. Nobody left. Even when it started to rain, we're just like, psst, yeah, little rain's not going to hurt. It's just water. We're waterproof. (laughs) Humans are waterproof. Our clothes aren't, but we are. (laughs) So this book has followed me my whole life, at least my whole adult life. So I'm going to share it with you tonight in the event that you have never heard it or in the event that you have read it and you loved it and you've missed it. I hope I do a good job in the reading. I hope it brings great meaning to you. And now that we're all ascending, it might bring us even more meaning than what we knew it could. There's something very special about this and I hope that by my reading it to you over the next several weeks, every Saturday, I hope that it will bring a great deal of joy, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to you. So without further ado, this is Khalil Gibran's 
the prophet. Al Mustafa, the chosen and the beloved, who was a dawn unto his own day, had waited twelve years in the city of Orphalis for his ship that was to return and bear him back to the isle of his birth. And in the twelfth year, on the seventh day of Ayalul, the month of reaping, he climbed the hill without the city walls and looked seaward, and he beheld his ship coming with the mist. Then the gates of his heart were flung open, and his joy flew far over the sea. And he closed his eyes and prayed in the silences of his soul. But as he descended the hill, a sadness came upon him, and he thought in his heart, How shall I go in peace and without sorrow? Nay, not without a wound in this spirit shall I leave the city. Long were the days of pain I have spent within its walls, and long were the nights of aloneness. And who can depart from his pain and his aloneness without regret? Too many fragments of the spirit have I scattered in these streets. Too many are the children of my longing that walk naked among these hills, and I cannot withdraw from them without a burden and an ache. It is not a garment I cast off this day, but a skin that I tear with my own hands. Nor is it a thought I leave behind me, but a heart made sweet with hunger and with thirst. Yet I cannot tarry longer. The sea that calls all things unto her calls me, and I must embark. For to stay, though the hours burn in the night, is to freeze and crystallize and be bound in a mold. Fain would I take with me all that is here, but how shall I? A voice cannot carry the tongue and the lips that gave it wings. Alone must it seek the ether. And alone and without his nest shall the eagle fly across the sun. Now when, the, now when he reached the foot of the hill... He turned again towards the sea, and he saw his ship approaching the harbor, and upon her prow the mariners, the men of his own land. And his soul cried out to them, and he said, Sons of my ancient mother, you riders of the tides, how often have you sailed in my dreams, and now you come in my awakening, which is my deeper dream. Ready am I to go, and my eagerness with sails full set awaits the wind. Only another breathe, oh, I'm sorry, only another breath will I breathe in this still air, only another loving look cast backward. And then I shall stand among you, a seafarer among seafarers. And you, vast sea, sleepless mother, who will loan our peace and freedom to the river and the stream? Only another winding will this stream make, only another murmur in this glade. And then shall I come to you, a boundless drop to a boundless ocean. And as he walked, he saw from afar men and women leaving their fields and their vineyards and hastening towards the city gates. And he heard their voices calling his name and shouting from field to field, telling one another of the coming of his ship. And he said to himself, Shall the day of parting be the day of gathering? And shall it be said that my eve was in truth my dawn? 
And what shall I give unto him who has left his plow in mid furrow, or to him who has stopped the wheel of his wine press? Shall my heart become a tree heavy laden with fruit that I may gather and give unto them? And shall my desires flow like a fountain that I may fill their cups? Am I a harp? that the hand of the mighty may touch me, or a flute that his breath may pass through me? A seeker of silences am I, and what treasure have I found in silences that I may dispense with confidence? If this is my day of harvest, in what fields have I sowed the seed, and in what unremembered seasons? If this indeed be the hour in which I lift up my lantern, it is not my flame that shall burn therein. Empty and dark shall I raise my lantern, and the guardian of the night shall fill it with oil, and he shall light it also. These things he said in words, but much in his heart remained unsaid, for he himself could not speak his deeper secret. And when he entered into the city, all the people came to meet him, and they were crying out to him as with one voice. And the elders of the city stood forth and said, Go not yet away from us. A noontide have you been in our twilight, and your youth has given us dreams to dream. No stranger are you among us, nor a guest, but our son and our dearly beloved. Suffer not yet our eyes to hunger for your face. And the priests and the priestesses said unto him, Let not the waves of the sea separate us now, and the years you have spent in our midst become a memory. You have walked among us a spirit, but your shadow has been a light upon our faces. Much have we loved you, But speechless was our love, and with veils has it been veiled. Yet now it cries aloud unto you, and would stand revealed before you. And ever has it been that love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. And others came also and entreated him, but he answered them not. He only bent his head, and those who stood near saw his tears falling upon his breast. And he and the people proceeded toward the great square before the temple. And there came out of the sanctuary a woman, whose name was Almitra, and she was a seeress. Or Ceres, Ceres. And he looked upon her with exceeding tenderness, for it was she who had first sought and believed in him when he had been but a day in their city. And she hailed him, saying, Prophet of God, in quest of the uttermost, long have you searched the distances for your ship. And now your ship has come, and you must needs go. Deep is your longing for the land of your memories and the dwelling place of your greater desires, and our love would not bind you, nor our needs hold you. Yet this we ask, ere you leave us, that you speak to us and give us of your truth. And we will give it... Oh, it's so sad to be... Okay, sorry, the empath in me comes out sometimes. Uh, so give, <laughs> give us of your truth, and we will give it unto our children, and they until their children, and it shall not perish. In your aloneness you have watched with our days, and in your wakefulness you have listened to the weeping and the laughter of our sleep. Now therefore disclose us to ourselves and tell us all that has been shown you of that which is between 
birth and death. And he answered, People of Orphalese, of what can I speak save of that which is even now moving within your souls? Then said Almitra, Speak to us of love. And he raised his head and looked upon the people, and there fell a stillness upon them. And with a great voice he said, When love beckons to you, follow him. Though his ways are hard and steep, and when his wings unfold, you yield to him. Though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you, and when he speaks to you, believe in him. Though his voice may shatter your dreams as the north wind lays waste the garden. For even as love crowns you, so shall he crucify you. Even as he is for your growth, so is he for your pruning. Even as he ascends to your height and caresses your tenderest branches that quiver in the sun, so shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth. Like sheaves of corn, he gathers you unto himself. He threshes you to make you naked. He sifts you to free you from your husks. He grinds you to whiteness. He kneads you until you are pliant. He And then he assigns you to his sacred fire that you may become sacred bread for God's sacred feast. And all these things shall love do unto you that you may know the secrets of your heart and in that knowledge become a fragment of life's heart. But if in your fear you would seek only love's peace and love's pleasure, then it is better for you that you cover your nakedness and pass out of love's threshing floor into the seasonless world where you shall laugh, but not all of your laughter. and weep but not all of your tears love gives not but itself and takes not but from itself love possesses not nor would it be possessed for love is sufficient unto love when you love you should not say God is in my heart but rather I am in the heart of God And think not you can direct the course of love, for love, if it finds you worthy, directs your course. Love has no other desire but to fulfill itself. But if you love and must needs have desires, let these be your desires. To melt and be like a running brook that sings its melody to the night, to know the pain of too much tenderness, to be wounded by your own understanding of love and to bleed willingly and joyfully, to wake at dawn with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving, to rest at noon, at the noon hour and meditate love's ecstasy, to return home at eventide with gratitude and then to sleep with a prayer for the beloved in your heart and a song of praise upon your lips. Then Almitra spoke again and said, And what of marriage, master? And he answered, saying, You were born together, and together you shall be forevermore. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. Aye, you shall be together even in the silent memory of God. 
but let there be spaces in your togetherness and let the wings, the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but not make a bond of love. Let me read that again. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Give one another of your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone. Even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping. For only the hand of life can contain your hearts. And stand together yet not too near together. For the pillars of the temple stand apart. And the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, Speak to us of children. And he said, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer seeks a mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is a stable, that is stable. Then said a rich man, speak to us of giving. And he answered, You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. For what are your possessions but things you keep and guard? For fear you may need them tomorrow. And tomorrow, what shall tomorrow bring to the overprudent dog bearing bones in the trackless sand as he follows the pilgrims to the holy city? And what is fear of need but need itself? Is not dread of thirst when your well is full, the thirst that is unquenchable? There are those who give little of the much which they have, and they give it for recognition, and their hidden desire makes their gifts unwholesome. And there are those who have little and give it all. These are the believers in life and bounty of life. And their coffer is never empty. There are those who give with joy, and that joy is their reward. And there are those who give with pain, and that pain is their baptism. And there are those who give and know not pain in giving, nor do they seek joy, nor give with mindfulness of virtue. They give as in yonder valley, the myrtle, bre the myrtle breathes, 
its fragrance into space. Through the hands of such as these, God speaks. And from behind their eyes, he smiles upon the earth. It is well to give when asked, but it is better to give through unasked, through understanding. And to the open-handed, the search for the one who shall receive is joy greater than giving. And is there aught you would withhold? All you have shall some day be given. Therefore give now, that the season of giving may be yours, and not your inheritors. You often say, I would give, but only to the deserving. The trees in the orchard say not so, nor the flocks in your pasture. They give that they may live, for to withhold is to perish. Surely he who is worthy to receive his days and his nights is worthy of all else from you. And he who has deserved to drink from the ocean of life deserves to fill his cup from your little stream. And what dessert greater shall there be than that which lies in the courage and the confidence, nay, the charity of receiving? And who are you that men should rend their bosom and unveil their pride that you may see worth their worth naked and their pride unabashed? See first that you yourself deserve to be a giver and an instrument of giving. For in truth, it is life that gives unto life, while you who deem yourself a giver are but a witness. And you receivers, and you are all receivers, assume no weight of gratitude, lest you lay a yoke upon yourself and upon him who gives. Rather, rise together with the giver on his gifts as on wings. For to be over mindful of your debt is to doubt his generosity, who has the free hearted earth for mother and God for father. And then an old man, a keeper of an inn, said, Speak to us of eating and drinking. And he said, Would that you could live on the fragrance of the earth and like an air plant be sustained by the light. But since you must kill to eat and rob the newly born of its mother's milk to quench your thirst, let it then be an act of worship. And let your board stand an altar on which the pure and the innocent of forest and plain are sacrificed for that which is purer and still more innocent in man. When you kill a beast, say to him in your heart, by the same power that slays you, I too am slain, and I too shall be consumed. For the law that delivered you into my hand shall deliver me into a mightier hand. Your blood and my blood is not, but the sap that feeds the tree of heaven. And when you crush an apple with your teeth, say to it in your heart, Your seeds shall live in my body, and the buds of your tomorrow shall blossom in my heart. And your fragrance shall be my breath, and together we shall rejoice through all the seasons. And in the autumn, when you gather grapes of your vineyards for the wine press, say in your heart, I too am a vineyard, and my fruit shall be gathered for the wine press. And like new wine, I shall be kept in eternal vessels. 
And in winter, when you draw the wine, let there be in your heart a song for each cup. And let there be in the song a remembrance for the autumn days, and for the vineyard, and for the wine press. Okay, we are going to continue this next week. I hope that you have enjoyed the beginning parts of The Prophet by Lebanese American writer and poet Khalil Gibran. As always, I love each and every one of you with my whole heart. And I give my my podcast is always free forever. And I'm hoping it will be <laughs> available forever so that you can listen anytime and as often as you would like. If you have any questions, comments, ideas for upcoming shows perhaps, or if you find it in your heart to make a, a small donation to my little podcast, you may do so via PayPal or just email me at metaphysicalsoulspeak at gmail.com. So, uh, well, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> I'll be back tomorrow with all new programming, unique content as always. And right now, <laughs> I am signing off with peace and joy and the high vibes of the holy fifth dimension. Until next time, guys, peace. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.